Hey, hey, everyone. It's Sleepy Reader. Um, appropriately enough, I am quite sleepy right now. I am in my messy office. Um, I've been sorting through comic books, trying to figure out which ones I've read and which ones I haven't. I've been falling way behind um, on the new comic book treadmill that I set up for myself. So I haven't done a comic book thoughts video, I think, in five or six weeks. Um, which is actually kind of painful to me because it's it's a diary that I'm used to writing, <laughs> used to recording uh, a, on a weekly basis when I can. Um, it's still fun to do the hauls and stuff, and I've had a lot of uh, back issue buying recently, so I let that kind of take over the channel. But I really want to get back into the swing of the covering the weekly comics that I get and I get a lot I get too many and uh, once I got behind it just became very hard I did drop like 11 comics I did a video about comics I was thinking of dropping and most of the ones I mentioned there I dropped a few I didn't one at least I dropped from my pull list but still picked up off the racks oh before I go too deep I wanted to point everyone towards um, Devin's new channel called Hello Wall, in which he does, I think about every other week, a long kind of new comic book review vlog kind of thing. So he talks about, he, he reviews a lot of new comics, plus he just talks about some other comic book and geek related things, movies or whatever. And so when you're when you have time for a longer form thing, I think Devin is really good to listen to that new channel of his. I don't think has a lot of viewers yet. So I'll, I'll put a link down below and in my description and please check him out. See whether it's something that might be of interest to you. <clears throat> so my idea tonight is that I've picked out a small handful of the comics that I've read in the past month, I think about 70 during the month, during the past, you know, four to five weeks. And I picked out some that I thought I had a little bit to say about. So I'm just going to throw out a few thoughts, hopefully not too many, about each comic. We'll see how this goes. Um, so to start with, I, I have, uh, is it four? Yeah, four four comics here that I'm pretty sure are my four favorite comics right now. Um, at least in a quick sort of shuffle through the comics I've read in the past month. So I don't, I'm not going to try to order them one against each other right now, maybe because I'm too sleepy or something, but right at the top here is uh, Lucifer from the Sandman universe. Still marked as DC Vertigo. So I don't know when the Vertigo label is actually going to go away or if it really is going away. Um, I think this is the most recent issue. Yeah. Um, and I just, I really loved it. I don't have anything new to say about it, but I continue to love this series. Uh, it's by Dan Waters. He has an indie book out now, which so far doesn't grab me as much, but I have only read the first issue of that. I have a second issue, but I haven't gotten around to reading it. And... Uh, also, way at the tops, I, I since I've last talked about it, I've read two issues of Ice Cream Man, both of which were very daring issues. This issue, called Palindrome, uh, takes the idea of the palindrome, you know, the word that you can read forwards and backwards the same, and makes a comic book that you can read forwards or backwards. And, in fact, um, you come to the middle, and then the the panels repeat themselves, but in reverse order and tell a different kind of story. It's pretty wild. Um, I loved it. At the same time, there's, a, there's the cheapskate of me that's saying, well, wait a minute, I just paid for half a comic repeated, but it was laid out in reverse, I guess. Um, I also then wondered, well, is the artist and the uh, letterer and the colorist being paid twice, or are they just being paid for half as many pages, 11 pages instead of 22, or however long Ice Cream Man is. So you can read it this way or that way. Um, and yeah, just amazing, daring stuff. The 
The issue after that was all about crossword puzzles, um, you know, incorporating crossword puzzles into into a very <laughs> a very powerful, disturbing horror story. It kind of returned to this crossword puzzle story. You know, this uh, this palindrome story was one of those mysterious stories of like, okay, is this part of some larger picture that we have about the Ice Cream Man series? Um, both of these, though, were kind of weird standalone stories, and yet with that missing certain bits of explanation about the Ice Cream Man. But anyway, uh, but then this story, the um, crossword puzzle, felt like a return to what I first I thought all the Ice Cream Man stories were going to be about the everyday life horrors in what seems to be an American suburb of a city. Um, and, and so this was very much that. And it actually, it's almost, it seemed to offer the characters a little bit of redemption, which is very shocking in an Ice Cream Man comic. But did it? Or is horrible things going to happen on the page following the last page of this comic? I think they are. Um, and so uh, that's two, Ice Cream Man and uh, Lucifer of my favorite comics. Another favorite comic is Criminal. And with this issue, it's the third issue in the current story that they're telling. Um, it brings it back up into the peak of my favorites. I think as this story was developing, I was liking it, but it wasn't quite as high it wasn't hitting me as hard as criminal normally does or hitting my pleasure button reader pleasure buttons as much but with this issue we're we're, we're getting as the story unfolds each issue so far has been sort of from a different person's point of view tackling the story from a different time point of view also and it really that effect of that piling up of the story really started kicking in for me with this third installment of the of the cruel summer, the cruel summer part three. This one, from the point of view of um, Teague's son, uh, is it Ricky? I think it's Ricky Lawless. Um, so a lot of this centers on the apparently the first time that Teague was ever really in love with a woman, um, and the first issue, the first issue of this storyline uh, was from the point of view of a private detective. Then it was from the point of view of Teague. Now it's from the point of view of um, of Ricky. Is it Ricky? I feel uh, there's the Lawless family. There's Ricky. There's Teague, and there's one other person. Um, yeah, Ricky. It is Ricky. I'm sorry. So it's it's the sleepy, <laughs> the sleepy reader style here. Um, so yeah, the only I did. The coloring seemed to have become even more simplified, and I am missing their old colorist a little more, I have to confess. At first, I thought that I was happy. In some of the other, the other issues of the series, I was quite happy with um, uh, Jacob Phillips' coloring. And, and maybe there's something that Jacob Phillips is up to here that I'm not getting. But it, it, my first instinct was to think it was... Compared to the, I'm still pretty good coloring, but compared to the high level that I'm used to, maybe the coloring felt a little more rushed, a little more quickly done. Um, then the fourth book in this uh, quadrumvirate of, of great comics in my full list is The Immortal Hulk. And um, this is issue 23. They, they seem to do two issues a month, almost all of them drawn amazingly by um by joe bennett i don't know how many comics a month he can do his artwork seems very detailed but maybe he's uh, a throwback to the old days of people who could do a lot of comics a month and still uh, create the quality um so this issue felt kind of like a climax or the first half of a climax maybe and so I, I enjoyed it. It was just full of creativity and excitement and horror. But it's funny that my psychology, just from being such a long time reader, it's like, how much longer can it stay this good? Will it, will it uh, 
will its climax be where it falls on its face, which occasionally some great comics do, or um, will the next storyline afterwards be where suddenly it takes the wrong turn and I no longer love it? Um, I certainly shouldn't. If I read 24 issues of the Immortal Hulk and love all of them at this level, I shouldn't begrudge it if it goes downhill a little bit afterwards. But I still worry about that. Um, but hopefully I'll be totally wrong. So um, after picking out those four great comics, I did not sort through these in terms of good to bad. So there's going to be a mix of things I have complaints about, things I was loving in the rest of these. Um, this is called Sarah and the Royal Stars. I still think it's kind of a cool comic, but it felt more random and maybe less, it felt less like the writers were, the writer, I think it's just one writer, is in control as compared to the first issue where I kind of, I kind of fell in love with this comic in the first issue. And now I'm wondering if I, uh, you know, put my love <laughs> love on the line a little too soon and I should be waiting. So it's, it's not horrible or anything, but it just didn't have, it just felt more like just kind of a typical fantasy story, I guess, without anything as distinct about it and a certain sense of randomness in the behavior of the characters and the events. Freedom Fighters is an one of the best DC comics out there right now, written by Robert Vendetti, and usually drawn by Eddie Burrows, and Eddie Burrows is back for this issue. And this is probably the intensest, most intense issue so far, where we get a very close look at the lives of some African-American characters in this alternate America where the Nazis took over, and where they, um, while they no doubt treat other Americans poorly and and we haven't heard what they've done to the Jews maybe they're all wiped out um, they definitely treat uh, people of brown skin color as um, objects as things as non-humans and it's pretty horrifying pretty terrifying my one so I thought it was a brilliant issue um, and I hope they explore this aspect of it a little more and one of my thoughts is when you look at storytelling, it's like you have a story. Who in the story is hurt most? That maybe should be the character that you focus on. And so in a sense, I'm thinking this story of Nazi America should start with the black point of view, uh, the African-American point of view, and not, uh, you know, that might maybe should be the center of the comic rather than just a peripheral story for one of the characters. Um, anyway, for me, this is the most powerful issue so far. It's still a great series. I'm not knocking it for having a mostly um, white point of view, but it is interesting to think about that. And um, we do have a problem as white readers or white writers of tending to want to make the white person the, the center of the story and here maybe, anyway, I just have that feeling of really the center of the story should be the black condor. Um, here's an interesting one. I'm not even sure what I want to say about, about Millennium. This is a two-issue series that Brian Michael Bendis is writing with lots of superstar artists on board for each little chapter. Um, just as a lead up to his Legion of Superheroes series, and it seems like this is a Bendis and maybe other people way of hyping something up. Oh, this is really important. We've got to have a prologue to the real story um, in this special issue. The art, the art was amazing. It's really kind of a weird story because spoilers, I guess, but it, you learn pretty quickly. Uh, it focuses on Thorn of Rose and Thorn from the old well, to me, from the old Superman family comics and as a backup strip in Lois Lane comics, I don't know any any Rose and Thorn beyond the Bronze Age. There might have been lots of Rose and Thorn that I missed. Um, I did not... I did not hate the Jim Lee part. <laughs> um, 
but uh, for me, he was outshined by the other artists. So the weird thing is, I think what, sorry, I'm being semi-incoherent about this, but I think what Bendis wants to do here is somehow explain all the futures that have been in various DC stories like Commandy and the Atomic Knights and the Legion of Superheroes and how do all those things line up because they doesn't make any sense humanity is pretty much gone in Commandy and what's left of them have no intelligence or very little intelligence and the animals are all intelligent so um, anyway that's just one example and rather than just let those be worlds in and of themselves uh, some people have the urge of tie, trying to tie it all together and I, I am not reading the current Hickman X-Men yet because um, I'm waiting for trade but I've heard people talk about it and it sounds like part one aspect of it is Hickman's trying to tie together all the different disparate X-Men futures that have been shown um, and explain them and Hickman's probably doing a lot more there than what's going on here in Millennium but this it's interesting that maybe there's an urge on both sides I think at least with this Legion of Superheroes I don't care really it's a fun pretty story I'm a little curious what you know I won't mind reading the next issue but all I really want to do is have some adventures of the Legion of Superheroes I don't need it all tied in but um, but it's kind of clever, I guess, when you can tie things in. And maybe Bendis wants to show off some clever idea he has. Hopefully it really is a clever idea. Um, but even if it isn't, I'll, it's still kind of fun seeing Rose and Thorn skipping through time there. Um, why Rose and Thorn would be an immortal character, I don't know. Uh, time will tell, hopefully. Or maybe some old issue told that I didn't read. Okay, Silver Surfer Black. This is a really good read. It's um, it's art is so amazing that it's really hard to even say <laughs> how amazing the rest of the story is. Um, it just gets better with each issue. I mean, mind blown. And uh, it's not just drawn by Trad Moore. It's colored by Dave Stewart. How many Marvel comics has Dave Stewart colored? For a while, I thought he was kind of the house colorist at at Dark Horse, and you wouldn't see him anywhere else. But um, he's also in a DC comic, at least one that I know of. But not only do I love these kind of wild, cover, wild, you know, big pages, I just love the way um, Treadmore has envisioned um, Ego, the Living Planet. And I love the kind of trippy time loops that were that are developing here in the writing. I do, you know, I, I was kind of like, oh, that's kind of a, they kind of have a weak reason for not stopping Galactus before he starts. However, I guess they have to do that. I mean, Galactus can't be gone from the universe, can he? Um, you know, cut off before he even starts. In a way, part of me wants to put Silver Surfer Black in my very top of the pile list, and I guess it is, but I, my brain can't tell me whether I just like it for the art. Like, it's a story that's good enough to give us this art, <laughs> but is it a great story? I just don't have a feeling for that somehow. Paper Girls 30, a double-sized final issue. Unlike the double-sized first issue, they did charge us extra for it, but I don't really hold that against them too much. Um, so one last double spread, double, what do you call it? Wrap around cover, um, not a reach around. Uh, and in this, we get kind of, it's really a coda to the story. So now I, I when I read issue 29, I thought that was the, I thought of it as the penultimate chapter of the time travel story. So I thought there was still some more time travel to go, but this is really the story of the return. And inevitably, the, the characters can't remember what had happened to them, but it makes this for a weird read. I know a lot of people really liked it, and I feel like I can't 
I can't fully judge it till I reread the whole series because I gotta figure some stuff out. Man or Black seemed really great. I've only read one issue, so I'm cautious to say it's going to be a great series, but I feel like it might. Um, kind of a, um, it's kind of got a different pace. It's a horror story. It's got kind of a different pace than your typical comic book horror story. I, I think it's intended to be kind of open-ended um, from something I thought I re heard Colin Bunn say. But anyway, I really enjoyed issue one, and I have issue two in my mess of comics still to be read, so I look, I really look forward to reading that. Um, I don't know why I never read uh, Tyler Crook and Colin Bunn's other series, um, Harrow County. I heard so many good things about it, and I guess I will someday read it. Um, something just kind of stopped me. But um, Tyler Crook seems like one of those artists, there's a few other artists, but one of those artists that really fits well with what Colin Bunn's doing. I should say, I keep calling it a Colin Bunn comic. I, it's a Colin Bunn and Brian Hurt written comic, an art by Tyler Crook. And so I don't know what their process is. Um, I, I, it's bad of me to just lump it as a Colin Bunn comic, but very promising. Once in Future, people are going wild over this. I liked it. I, but because I already knew they were going wild with it, I expected some bigger twist or something more unusual. It's kind of the story of a guy who discovers that his grandmother is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It, it that's very reductive, but that's how I felt about it. Um, so, and, and mixed in with that, we get um, a King Arthur story, but as kind of a dark horror thing in a sense. Um, but one note is when it's, when it opened up, I thought, oh, maybe this kind of overweight bald guy will be a main character. And wow, that's great. I love it because I'm an overweight bald guy. I'd like to see more of them <laughs> starring in the, in the story. But, but then that guy got killed right away. <laughs> and our main character turns out to be this really handsome young professor with lots of hair and lots of good looks. Um, and the other main character is his grandmother, um, who is, you know, Buffy. Let's see if I can find a good picture of her grandmother without giving too much away. Oh, there she is. The Dan Mora art and the coloring by Tamara Bonvillain are like a perfect match. So this, you know, from an art point of view, this is a definite, I will stick with this book. Um, and I always like things involving King Arthur. Uh, but I'm not quite sure why the rest of the world, the rest of the comic world, was so excited over Once in Future. But a good comic. I like it. Another good comic is, and I've read the first two issues, is Valeria. Whoops. I, I sometimes forget which side of the camera. Um, which has these painted covers. Art. Uh, computer trying to go to sleep. Art by some someone named A N E K E Aneki Anek Anek I don't know never heard of them uh, could be a man or a woman uh, the art style is a little I don't oh, actually this page the the character is a little cute <laughs> the character of Valeria. Um, I don't know if Valeria, I think Valeria comes from an actual Conan story. She had an appearance in one story, Red Nails, I believe. And she was a notable woman warrior who, who didn't, you know, didn't take any guff from Conan. And uh, I don't think she was willing to sleep with him. Um, and so basically as tough as Conan. So here it doesn't, to me, in my headspace, it doesn't really feel like the same world that Conan exists in, but it's a good, a well done fantasy story, a well done uh, sort of coming of age in a fantasy world story of a young swordswoman, and I'm really enjoying it. So I'm, I'm suddenly, between this and the one-shot one issue of Conan she wrote, 
I'm really liking Meredith Finch now, um, who I have to confess, uh, I mean, I tried her Wonder Woman comics, but I even before I read them, I kind of looked down on her in a certain way because all she'd written were some Grimm's fairy tale comics for that where they adultify the Grimm fairy tale stories for with sexy women uh, what's the publisher I can't remember that and the fact that it looked like you know she has a very famous comic book artist husband so it looked like she just was being given these opportunities even though she didn't have the experience or talent because her husband had clout but now now I have to take that back I think she has a lot of talent and is a good storyteller so I I will I think well, it doesn't say here, but I think Valeria is a miniseries. I'll definitely write it out, and I will look for more comics by Meredith Finch. Another Conan. This was a one-shot, a wordless comic by Is Isad Ribic, a really great artist for things like Conan. He's, he's been doing a lot of the covers. He has a bit of a Frank Frazetta look to him. So he's the writer and artist of a wordless comic, which basically shows young Conan uh, on a journey from his homeland to wherever he's going for his next adventure. Um, and so it's really just a series of events in a way. It's a fun series of events if you already kind of know who Conan is and you just get to see him going from one place to another and having adventures. Uh, if I think if you didn't know about who Conan was and you didn't, or even if you did and didn't sort of read the setup here, you might be like, well, okay, he's walking through a snowy place and then he ends up somewhere else and he fights some bears and then he fights some people. He gets strung up and then he escapes and kills people and that's the end of the story. But... For a one shot, if you're already a Conan fan, already a Isad Ribic fan, it's it's definitely fun to read or to look at. I think in the long run, I don't really. I mean, it is a comic book. It is a comic, um, but I don't feel like comics are their full selves without words and pictures together. It's a synthesis of that, and um, so anyway. I'm happy with the occasional wordless comic, but overall it's not, I wouldn't be addicted to comics if they were all wordless. <clears throat> Superman Up in the Sky kind of increased my sense of Tom King's disconnection from superheroes and his, everything he does, like, so I've heard him in a podcast talk about how he knew he was writing. This was the series that originally appeared in the Walmart series at 12 pages at a time. And he knew he was writing for a young audience, knew he was writing for a general audience. But he can't help here make everything kind of an abstraction. And not really, maybe he's true to his feelings about Superman, but he's not really true to a character that's Superman. He just manipulates who Superman is and what's going on with him based on the kind of shtick he wants to do in his story. So, um, you know, in one story, Superman's kind of a pathetic neurotic um, and a victim of bureaucracy. And then in the other story, uh, the other story just doesn't eat. Superman, for some reason, is even though he's on a journey traveling through space looking for a young girl he wants to rescue, this episode is just this abstraction of him fighting alongside Sergeant Rock. I don't know if it's a different time or a different uh, universe that he's passing through where Sergeant Rock fights an endless war. It's World War One, it looks like, rather than World War II, but I, I guess. It's just an abstraction. Um, yeah. So Tom King, to me, is a really interesting writer, but I don't know if he's, he's so clued in. I don't know. You know, when it comes to giving, you know, pl 
playing towards an audience and uh, yeah I don't know on the other hand my favorite um, Brian Michael Bendis comic right now is this Batman universe which also appeared in those Walmart giant comics 12 12 pages at a time each month and um, maybe it's it's the inspiration of Nick Darrington, but it, it's kind of a love letter to all the wacky um, DC stuff. So um, in one issue, in one story, we've got a wild Thanagar story um, where, where Batman shows up. Another one, um, Dinosaur Island with, uh, with the Green Lantern. We got a uh, kind of a what gangland adventure with the green green arrow and um, a wild and woolly a, a visit to Gorilla City. Um, the art is incredible by Nick Darrington. The color again is by Dave Stewart, and uh, I'm just loving this. It's all kind of Batman's trying to solve some mystery at this point. I can't even remember what that mystery is. Too many comics, too late at night. Um, but uh, it started with the Riddler. Um, but someone's behind it. Anyway, I can't remember now. But this is just really fun. And I look forward to kind of rereading it all when it's all done. And uh, I hope Brian Michael Bendis takes some inspiration there when he d writes the... Um, the Legion of Superheroes. I mean, there's lots of characterization and intensity sometimes amongst the Legion of Superheroes, but it also there's just a lot of fun. Speaking of fun, Curse Words continues to be fun and we're definitely, I mean, I don't know exactly how many issues are left, but we're definitely in the final, final phase of this um, really good comic book story, this uh, series. And, um, and they're still pulling out surprises. Um, there's a big surprise in this issue. I don't want to give it away for um, something that, uh, that our hero, Wizard, uses a magical spell to do as a way to potentially defeat our friend um, uh, Syzygy. However, um, it's going to create all kinds of other problems. So anyway, lots of fun, lots of clever twists. The crazy art, crazy characters. Um, how big of a role does Margaret play in this issue? She plays somewhat of a role, but I think a wizard takes over for the moment. But I bet, I bet we'll have one more big Margaret moment. And finally, at the bottom of this pile is Gogor number five, which apparently is the final issue of Gogor. Is that oh, some smut thing got? food got stuck on that cover that's that um i really love gogor it's definitely a kids middle reader style comic i think it will if it can find that big middle reader audience for graphic novels that's out there now that you know they're tapping into with a lot of the book publishers i think it could sell very well but apparently, because the individual issues haven't been selling well, it's dead. It, so it ended. And it ends on a kind of upbeat note of, yeah, we're going to go take the fight to the bad guys, but this doesn't end the story. Um, and I vaguely wondered if the story was changed in this fifth, fish, fifth issue because he suddenly realized that was it. So he does a little comic strip of himself as kind of a little hobbit type character uh, explaining, uh, well, explaining briefly what I just said, that the sales were low. Um, and then he talks about negativity uh, on YouTube and Twitter. And uh, let's see. I also want to say something regarding some online trends affecting the industry in recent years. I'm not talking about the critically thoughtful review sites out there. They're great. 
I mean, yeah, some of them are, but mostly a lot of them just do very positive reviews without any criticalness. Um, but those clowns who use YouTube and Twitter to trash comics, sometimes literally ripping them in half and personally insult creators, they poison the discourse, inhibit creators, and worst of all, disrespect the craft. I agree that those people are out there on YouTube and Twitter, but I'm out there on YouTube and Twitter too, and it makes me kind of sad that that's what they, you know, the good guys are the people with the websites and the bad guys are YouTube and Twitter. Um, yeah. So anyway, fake controversies and news regarding movies and video games dominate the headlines. Well, many great comics, even from legendary creators, often go unnoticed. It does feel like, in general, if you love comics, you should be out there pointing out the good ones. And hopefully that's what a lot of us are doing here on YouTube. I complain about a few comics, you know, the Tom Kim comic or whatever. But, um, but we're here together searching for the comics that we'll love to read. And... Uh, I'm sad that a lot of the professionals now think that those of us who are on YouTube are all um, crazed Planet of the Apes gorillas attacking comic books for the love of warfare, if nothing else. Um, anyway, I hope that this makes it into a trade that gets into the hands of kids and they just decide to do another trade or, you know, in a crazy ideal world, some editor at one of those places like um, HarperCollins or um, what's it called, uh, Scholastic, is watching me and saying, hey, I should contact Ken Gehring and sign a contract with him to do this, to publish this book and two more Gogor books uh, in a trilogy of Gogor adventures for kids because it's going to be hot stuff for the kids and they'll love it. Anyway, that's my... <laughs> That's my pipe dream for tonight. I hope you're all well, sleep well, read comic books well, drink well. <laughs> Not alcoholic or alcoholic, however you prefer. Caffeinated or uncaffeinated. And I will be back soon. <laughs>